I'm Kim Hayden, your host, and if this is your first time joining us, welcome to the show. This is where we speak with industry leaders in real estate from development to support, uh, to buying, selling, investing, you name it. Anything that touches real estate and real estate agents' lives, these are the subject matters that we go out and find the industry best to come and share their insight with us. So, uh, you know, I'm super excited today because this guest, this guest is going to be shedding some light on some things that are my personal greatest challenge in this industry of real estate. Uh, and let me bring him on in here. Awesome. Good morning, Kurt. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me, Kim. I'm just going to read out. Kurt has a great bio here and, uh, He's a bit of an icon and uh, in the industry itself, and they had some big news last year. So getting a lot of eyeballs, not only on the businesses that he has built and supported over the years, but also Kurt himself. So Kurt is a globally recognized marketer, operator, and speaker. He's built and run businesses from startup to over 500 million annual revenue. He's assembled teams across six continents and been part of small team leading in an IPO, 880 million, and participated in dozens of acquisitions. He was at the front lines creating several of the marketing channels we use today, including social media management, influencer marketing, and location-based in marketing. In recent years, he is focused on helping individual business owners and marketing agencies with heavy focus on real estate in the United States. Kurt and his team have, ad, have analyzed more than 50,000 real estate websites over each of the past three years and the agent businesses behind them to identify what works and what doesn't in modern marketing. So, you know what? Hang on tight because this is, uh, you know what, we're going to walk away with something today that you can implement. I promise. All righty, Kurt, this is where we're going to get down. I need a little pre-frame because not every five-year-old sits there and goes, I want to figure out how to solve tech stacks and social media. Wait, was there even any of that around when you were a five-year-old? And what drives you to do what you do today? Um, what drives me is actually just people. So, I mean, I, uh, I, I tend to work in a lot of different industries over time and, um, it's, I kind of go where there's hard problems and there's complexity that, um, that people are struggling with. And so I have a heart for helping people. And so, um, really that's, that's kind of what drives me to, to wherever I'm at and where I'm going. And so I kind of come into real estate a lot of ways because I speak a lot. I write a lot about servant leadership. That's a lot of the communities that I, I hang out in. And so there's a lot of servant leaders in real estate. A lot of people that aren't, but a lot of are. And so that's where I gravitate. Well, and so as a child, was tech something that you were always engaged in? Or what what part of this, what component? Because we always have a component that we're really driven by. What is it that inspires you to stay within this space? I do like technologies, but um, I got kind of, I think I kind of got drug into it. So I don't know if it's my DNA or what, but my... Uh, my dad worked with uh, Bell Labs, which was kind of the apple of the day and uh, as it's kind of tail end. And so um, my dad and I, we were kind of blessed with uh, within our genes of I don't sleep very much. So my dad didn't only slept about an hour and a half a night um, until his third bout with cancer. And so then he started sleeping like, more like a normal person. And so I was eight to nine years old when I first actually built ours uh, through Bell Labs, what became Lucent Technologies. His dad took me to work and I solved some problems and he's like, we pay consultants for this. And so um, we're going to pay you. And uh, I mean, I didn't work too much, but I did solve some problems. So I've been on technology since single digit ages, uh, you know, in early, you know, early 80s even. So 
And technology is actually a phobia for many people. And yet there is not a single industry that I can think of that does not touch on some form of automation or or tech, technology. Like when we think even people who have small home cleaning companies need to have an automation around their billing and their, their uh, uh, bookkeeping, right? So we're all getting touched by this. And yet this still seems to be an issue or a phobia that a lot of people put off. It's kind of like cleaning out the back of your closet. And it's like, I know I need to deal with it. And I bet you there's something useful there. And I bet you I can wear something, but I'm not going there. It's just too well, much. It's also a phobia. And sometimes it's a it's an excuse for not doing the work that we should be doing. And so I just say it for myself. I love technology. I've been around technology almost my entire life. And um, you know, too many, so many people are looking for the next gadget, the next tool, the next system that's going to fix something. And so like I noticed with myself, like I, and so everybody that works with me, my friends, mentors, they laugh because like I have an addiction to buying new technology and new tools, like new SaaS products. And so they're like, oh my gosh, Kurt's got to like, people will come to me and say, hey, I'm looking for something that does this. But I'm, I probably have 12 of those type of tools and certain whatever it is that I've tried. And so like, you know, literally over the weekend, I took a week off. I, I, I just had a baby. My wife had her baby just almost a year ago. And I think I might have taken a week off when Hannah Grace came. I took a week off last week from the day job. And still, what what was I? I was feeling antsy. And so I started looking online for like new tools that I could kind of try and buy. And I had to speak to myself and be, I have a bunch of things that work right now. Why am I trying to look for something new and shiny that would solve issues <laughs> that I already have great solutions for? And so if I struggle with that, I mean, I know agents do that. It's like, if you have something that works, you should use that versus looking for something new. You, and you know what? That's funny because um, I hosted a show here in Canada called uh, Kim's Kitchen where I would have top chefs come in and they'd get 60 minutes to put a healthy family meal on the table. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that sounds like a chef in a kitchen store. Yeah. It's like, I have five gadgets that can crack an egg. However, this one is it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so, so it's like, but you're right. It's, it's complicated, but I think also like, Myself, I often, I, I sh I'm looking for that next thing, usually technology that will solve my problem as opposed to, hey, this is the problem and I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I should be looking for the best solution for my business, for my operations that may or may not be this tool. And, and so as opposed to just looking for something new, it might be something I already have um, and I'm just not fully utilizing. And so it, it, they so often in real estate, people I think gravitate towards the new when they should be focused on what they currently have. And that's not just about technology. That's about leads. I mean, which, uh -huh. the, which uh, you know, so much technology helps with agents stay focused on, I need a new lead. When, when I look at successful agents, those that are doing, you know, six and seven figure GCI a year, what, what yeah. I actually look at their business is the vast majority of their, of their closed transactions come from people that they are, did a transaction with before, or that were in their CRM for like, 18 to 36 months before they did a transaction. So it's actually not the new lead. And so we get so focused on new, whether it's technology or, or a contact, we forget what we already have that works well. Exactly. They don't understand. I, I, I love, so in the old days of real estate, when brokers had a lot more, you know, in-person time to sit down and go through how to get set up, they would do the sphere of influence. Right. And there was this great exercise. And I, and even though I was brand new, so I want to, I want to pre-frame where I was at. I'm from Wichita, Kansas, ended up in Toronto, Ontario, married. I, I went to Vegas and met a man. He was awesome. He is awesome. Uh, ended up in Toronto, ended up in Calgary with a baby. And I had, so I had two kids. But when I came to Calgary, I had never not worked. And I went to my husband and I said, you're going to find your children on a milk carton if I don't get a job because this is not working. It is a hard job being a at full time productive mother because that is a domestic engineer. That is like a, a degree beyond my ability. So he goes, why don't you? So I said, I want to open a, a coffee shop because I love to talk. And he goes, I love to talk and bake. And he goes, you know, you have to be up at 4 a.m. I said, okay, maybe not a coffee shop. And he goes, why don't you go into real estate? It looks easy. Famous last words. Yep. Real estate, 99. 
My favorite part was discovering that I actually had a sphere if I just chose to lean in. And because I had no family, no past education, no past work, no, like, and lived in a brand new community, but that brand new community became the vehicle. I find that a lot of agents, like you said, are always looking for a new and shiny gadget. Let me ask you this. If there were to go not to adopt another single new tool for 24 months and only use utilize the tools that are available today, could they be successful if they choose to lead in? I, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, yes. I mean, there's... I, even if they're not using tools, because every agent has Google Sheets, and it's like you could, I could grow, I could grow as, as well into six-figure GCI business just by tracking things in Google Sheets. There's tools that do it better, but I, there's nothing new that's needed for most agents, and so you just need something that's better than than post it Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, uh, folks, tip to ensure that all your notes get into your database. Get rid of the post-it notes and get a glass top desk because if you don't put it in your database, it ends up on the sleeve of your shirt. You learn really quickly to get stuff put where it's supposed to be. Um, With that being said, I want to talk lead generation. I see a lot of people who are putting a lot of money into lead generation and they are not closing any deals. So they are sending Zillow a ton of money. They are sending Facebook a ton of money. And yet they're not closing any deals. Let's, if we could unpack this for a moment and talk about the number one, the number one thing we hear from all real estate agents is leads. Now, like you said, if they're we're building their business right, by the time you hit seven, year seven, you should be 50% of that revenue is from referrals and repeat. But just say, it, let's go to leads. Yeah, the, 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 one thing that's missing from almost every agent's um, uh, equation for what they should be doing is a website that their clients will actually use for their home search. And, and, and because even if they're, whether, whether they're, they figured out Google and they, they're writing blogs or they're doing YouTube or TikTok, they're getting leads or paying Zillow or someone else. The one thing I can guarantee every agent is if you don't have your own website on your own domain that your clients will actually use, no matter where, how, no matter how you get your leads, I can guarantee you that your agents are going to go to something like Zillow or Redfin or Trulia, and they're going to do their search. And what happens then? A competitive agent is going to call them. So you may have paid, you may have the best lead gen pr- uh, process, whether it's pay per click or organic or social media. But but even though you may get the contact information, your clients are still going to go use one of those big portals where you know a competitive agent is going to call them. And that's different than any other industry. Plumbers don't have to deal with this. Electricians don't have to deal with this. Coffee shops don't have to deal with it, where you get a customer or a potential customer and you know that a competitor is going to contact them. That's different in real estate because consumers are doing the search themselves. Unless you're truly working with super high-end luxury clients that are buying $50 million homes, they're doing the search themselves. And so if you don't have a site that they're actually going to use, they're going to be going somewhere else. And that's where I find most agents fall because they're, whether it's lead gen or they're working the sphere and clients they already have, it, there's this leak of a sales funnel because it's all a sales funnel, no matter the industry. And so you're dumping, me dumping a bunch of leads and what's out the side is this giant hole that goes to Zillow where competitive agents are calling. And it's almost, to me, it's scarier for new agents than it is existing agents. It affects existing agents more from a dollar figure, but a new agent, hey, if, if I was in your shoes years ago and I just moved from doing whatever, whether I'm a teacher and accountant, and now I call my aunt and she's like, Kurt's an agent now, and she goes to Zillow. Well, now she's in a cognitive dissonance. I want to work with Kurt. I know he's good in other things, but he's new in real estate. And this agent that called my, called my phone 45 seconds after I filled out some form on Zillow has closed 90 deals this year. Well, why should I actually work with Kurt? So from as a new agent or, or, or a lower producing agent, man, that loss of GCI from somebody who's super close is going to hurt my business much more. 
And that actually goes right back into the formula. If you're new to the business and your aunt doesn't know that you're in the business and she hasn't been shared your URL and you haven't used the proper script to introduce yourself to your aunt, because your aunt's not moving for another 20 years. So why would you use a canned script on buy or sell with me? Why wouldn't you have a coffee with your aunt? And like this literally is such an like overarching, like there's so many issues that why are people so afraid to talk to Aunt Martha? And um, let's see here. Oh, I got questions. What does the future of residential real estate look like? And what advice for <laughs> this? I just got. Ooh, these are <laughs> see. This is our offline. So we the only places that you can see the counter is like people who are specifically on our Facebook group. This is our LinkedIn, I think. Yeah. Um, so Kurt, so before I go into my tangent of new agents, we're going to circle back around to, um, we ha I have two questions I want to ask. So keep these in mind. What is the least used asset within our IDX, our, our, our stacks that you notice because you're in the space, you'll know what people are not using that they should use. Um, and the other one is, is uh, top three tips to maximize for new agents. However, we just got one from you, which is get that personal URL. But we're going to dive into these because these are good. Kurt, what does the future of real estate look like for you? Oh, for me, um, privacy. Um, and I say that because I my wife has made me stop asking people at church and dinners a uh, question about do they know what happens when they when they go to Zillow? And they do a home search because it disrupts the entire dinner. We've been at church, at Sunday school, at barbecues, and I'll ask somebody, being like, "Hey, like, you know, especially if somebody's looking for a home or they're doing infotainment, do you know what Zillow? You know, Zillow earned two billion dollars selling your information to advertisers, basically. And what ends up happening is the wife or husband will call over their partner from the other side of the yard." And be like, wait a second, come here, come here. You didn't use our real email address, did you? Because they didn't, they had no idea that Zillow's primary part purpose is selling that information and, and, and from a revenue perspective. And I think from a growing perspective, the agents I see killing it point out to to their to their sphere that says, look, my job is to protect your information and that includes your financial information and contact info. You want to work with another agent, that's great. I'm never going to give your information to somebody unless you ask me to. And that's different than the big portals. And when agents figure out how to communicate that, it fundamentally changes their business. Brilliant. So you go on to Zillow, you put in information, it's now being sold. So Zillow and Facebook, I think, have similar kind of models, you know, yeah. there's, there's all sorts of, cause I mean, we are, this is the matrix folks. We are the battery of, <laughs> Well, I mean, nobody realizes it either. Like the moment you ask somebody, you're like, would you ever take your 401k, your retirement account and go fill out a form online that says you're going to move it from fidelity to somewhere in the next 60 days and it's worth a million dollars or half a million dollars? No, but, but that's what you do when you go say, I'm looking for a new condo in downtown Toronto. You say, I'm willing to make, I'm going to be making a million dollar financial transaction in the next 60 days. That's worth money, right? For people to have that. And people go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. I'm like, it's worth $2 billion a year. That's about what uh, Zillow gets from an advertising perspective. And people go, oh. And, and to clarify, so I have my uh, website currently. We have a personal URL, have had for forever, even before, you know, uh, any of these programs. We are using, uh, we do have a overall all-in-one platform that we use. Um, when somebody puts their information into my teamhaden.ca website, then their information is with me and is safe with me because I'm not selling or spamming them. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So that's actually a really huge personal thing that people can offer their communities and their clients and everything. That's incredible. And, that was... and you can borrow the wording from, from, from another industry and how you interact with potential clients. It's the difference between a fee-based financial advisor and, and, and those that just take a percentage um, from, from working with things. And so 
fee-based financial advisors, their, their entire script is usually, we make no money from the assets that we put you into. And so you pay me for a financial plan. You pay me for my consulting time. I don't make a back-end commission from anything. That's very different than people that just get that earn referral fees, depending on what assets that they put you into. And so how those mark, how they market and like, you know, my wife and I work with a group on the financial side called Ron Blue uh, Trust, how Ron Blue markets that it's all about that model there. That's very different. It's a whole different line of financial advisors than other more, you know, more portfolio based that, that earn those commissions on the backside. Real estate agents, they can adopt that same thing. And when they do, it fundamentally changes their sphere. It also changes referrals too, because the moment I engage a, new, a client and they realize that I'm going to protect their information that way. And what happens if they use some of the, uh, some, uh, some larger portals, well, they tend to bring that up in conversation as well. Wow. And the Americans are not um, as privy to realtor.com as Canadians are. Canadians are very, very, I think that's why Zillow has struggled so hugely right. in Canada is because of the Privacy Act. Um, and because of uh, realtor.ca is really paying a ton of money to get people to use their platform. So, okay. And then we're going to go now. The second question on the list that came from one of our listeners was, what advice do you have for new agents? Now, the first advice that Kurt gave us is go secure a domain name. First, know who your spheres are identify your brand and secure that domain name, even if it's just your name. It could be Kim Hayden, real estate agent, or oh, Kim Hayden, real estate maven.com. There you go. I think I'm going to get a new domain today. What are the other two things that you can recommend, Kurt? Um, the, the One other thing I would say is they need to write out and practice a bio, but there's three versions of their bio that they need. And just saying that you sell real estate or you help put people in new houses is not a bio. <laughs> it has to be a bio that somebody would care about in some way. And so, and the more niche down, the better. So the examples I think about are the, 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 the Keller Williams agent that helped my wife and I buy this house. Um, he works for really as a team, a team with two other agents. They tend to, you know, pass one, uh, pass leads back and forth when they have too much business at any one time. And all Bobby helps are married couples in their mid twenties to early forties with young kids, predominantly that go to these two churches in Roswell, Georgia and East Cobb, Georgia, the, just, just over the uh, County line. That's, that's all, that's his narrow focus. And so well, you know, he'll refer out other business, but he gets so like, because of that, my wife and I didn't have young kids yet, but Bobby was able to bring up questions to us. We knew we chose him over like probably eight friends, good friends that are agents. Um, because Bobby helped people like where we were. So he, we knew how, based on how he presented himself, that yep. he was going to bring up questions that were relevant to where we were going in our next stage in life that we wouldn't even have thought of yet. And so the only people yep. he helps outside of that are people that often got divorced and now they're trying to sell a home to somebody like who he typically sells because he can market that. That's a focus. Um, you know, somebody that's, you know, Hey, I, I help single, I had some of them. I help singles. I, uh, I help singles in, uh, downtown Chicago by high rise condos. Wow. That's super focused. And, and those businesses help well, but that's the shorter version. You need to have like a Twitter length version or when somebody asks just quickly in a conversation, you need to have probably like a, like a 45, you know, or like a, maybe a two minute version, uh, two minute version of it. And you need to have like a 10 minute version of it. Like if you were being presented and talking more about your business and you need to have it written down and practice because that drives everything else in your business, whether it's a website or emails, but most agents don't do that to actually either one, take the effort to write it down or practice it. So when somebody asks, Hey, what do you do that you can actually answer? Exactly. And that's, that is so, that is so critical. Um, I want everybody who listens to this and I want you to, to really understand this, you need to know your mega niche and your micro niche, and you need to know who you're speaking to. Because when you speak to everyone, you're speaking to no one. Yep. And a confused mind never buys. Yep. So, I mean, I was very, everybody laughed because they would call my area that I worked in the bubble. Yep. I knew exactly who my market was. I mirrored my market in its in its stage of life. It was young families, 
in a deep south community that was the last left off the highway. And my goal was to create community connectivity. So I actually attracted really, I honestly, out of over over 1,500 real estate transactions, I can literally count on my hands and toes, so my fingers and toes, that number out of 1,500 of people that I would not do business with and I would not want to have in my home because we're in a people business. So that means I have over 1,498 or 1,480 people, 1,480 people that I would have to my home. Now, my home's not that big, folks, so not everybody show up at once, please. But I, I think that's really critical. In writing these third party bios, do you have tips on how to get past yourself? Because this is a big challenge for a lot of new agents. I've never sold a house. How am I going to write a bio? Um, and maybe strategies on how to go out and get that bio. Um, yeah, two things. So one is when you're writing it, I some, I mean, I actually do this from a physical perspective, whether it's you can put on glasses or take off glasses or put on a hat is you need to tell yourself. And if you need to do something, a physical reminder is I know nothing about Kurt Euler's business. What do the words on my on the screen tell me about Kurt Euler's business that I should care? And 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 review and and write that way, and then review it yourself that way. Because if you don't know anything about your business and you read that and it doesn't it doesn't make you care, nobody's going to care. So that's the first kind of step. And the second thing is you need to be very uh, very open uh, to being hurt by people that you care about. And so it's a, do it as a Google Doc. And share it with and share it with super trusted people that know you, and 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 you have to give them permission in writing and in person that says, look, you the only way you hurt my feelings is by not giving me raw feedback, and I, I need to make sure. Do, would you care about this? Here's who I'm trying to target. Is that you or, or picture that you're that person? Do you care? And you let them hurt you. And they, and people won't want to do it, but you need to give them permission to and follow up and follow up on them. And you need to do it like somewhere between three and 12 people to get feedback from them. Excellent. And your third point, and then we're going to move on real quick. So uh, third point. Third point, point, you need to have, as a new agent, you need to always keep a copy of your contact database in tools or a system that you own and control, not your broker. Now, I'm not saying don't use your broker tools. Some brokers offer great tools, but but at least in the US, and it's pretty much the same in Canada, in the US, NAR says agents on average change brokerages every five years. And so that means, and, and some it's a lot faster than that. Some it's every two, because the average is five. So what happens when all of your contacts are in there? I was just on, I think it was lab code agents, might've been real closers on Facebook. And some there's somebody was telling the this horror story that they told their broker that they were leaving and the broker disconnected them at that moment as the broker should have at that point, because that's the broker's business. And they had no content. They had no copy of their database for the four and a half years that they had been in business. And so guess what? They get to rebuild. And so you're, you're in the U S you're a 1099 and contractor. And most countries, you're your own business. And so the brokers are there to help you, but it's your business. So protect your asset. Your second most important asset is your contact database. And so it needs to be in a Google sheet or something that you own. Your brand, your contact, brand, contact, and your database. Protect this, folks. I, 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 this is so, um, and I see this personally. I'm actually right now working with somebody who got locked out of the, a, a, a lead gen sync program that had all of the contacts because they were a buyer's agent. And yes, there there was some things, but they're actually moving to another side of the country. And all they wanted to do was reach out and say, hey, by the way, it was lovely working with you. However, they're now starting from 100% scratch. So the people that you serve, and by the way, if you're on a team, do look at your local laws because the reality is uh, team leads will can, can say you can't use any of this or you can't farm my area or you can't do that. Right. However, people buy and sell with people they know, like, and trust. And who are we serving? This again goes into 
you know, that whole silo thing. Who are we serving? All right. So real quick, I want to dive into what is showcase because I myself have challenges in CRM management. Um, uh, IDX, Internet Data Exchange, Showcase IDX mm -hmm. is, so I'm on a larger program, conversion, right? That is an all-in-one. What is Showcase IDX and how, and let me, and tell, in really dumbed down versions, pretend you're talking to your mom. I'm probably old enough to be your mom, but tell me what is Tech Stack Solutions? So an all-in-one like conversion, KB Core, um, many of these others, they, they're, they're what the, exactly what the, that term is. They're technology that does a little bit of everything. So they'll do a website, they'll do a CRM, they'll send out email. Maybe you can check a box, pay some money for ads in there. That's different than a tech stack where you're choosing the best of the individual tools of technology for to do those things for you. And so one of those things that you get with uh, the all-in-ones is a website. But very seldom, if ever, have I heard an agent say, my all-in-one, my, you know, kurt.kw.com, my KV Core website, very seldom do I hear an agent say, my clients actually use my home search. And so what Showcase IDX does is it is it provides just that home search on a, your own website if you build it separate. Now, a lot of times you can still connect that website to your all-in-one platform, and, and that's a great thing. But Showcase only, it takes the data from your MLS and it puts it in a search that your clients will actually use on your website. Okay, and what are the three things that people should have on their website that will encourage people to love their website and use it? Well, one is to showcase IDX, because it's not us. The, the research says that any of the other home searches out there, um, <laughs> clients will go and use a realtor.com or a Zillow um, via almost any other IDX or these all-in-one platforms. And so having showcase on there is the first thing. The next thing is actually building out these local community pages. So I mentioned I'm in Roswell, Georgia. If that was my service area, I should have, uh, if I only do houses, then I don't want to have community pages for condos on there. Even though you might search for them, I'm probably going to do neighborhoods. I'm going to do homes for sale in Roswell, homes for sale near Roswell High School. I live in Bristol Oaks. I'm going to have a community page for Bristol Oaks with just listings from there on it. And I would build those out with my IDX and on my site. And the, the, the second thing is you should, um, it's not even actually what's on your site is um, we kind of mentioned about like the least used features is once you have that site with a home search, what people aren't doing is they're not following up with clients. We talked about like your aunt before that might not be selling in 20 years and they're not following up with their sphere or past clients or family. And in a non selly way saying, God, there's a ton changing in the market. Things are crazy right now. Can I just set you up a home search about like open houses so that you can see what your neighbors are doing to what if they're remodeling their bathroom, maybe you want to go take a look at it, but you can see it. Or like when you know somebody's not actively buying and selling, which is like 95% of your sphere at any one time, just saying, hey, can I just set you up with, to, you know, with a, with a new listings alert? So once a week, you'll get an email that you know just what's happening in your area. It's a non selly way to reach out. And that feature that's on there, you can put that in words as something you'll do, but it's a way that it's going to be a constant drip reminder that always said, hey, curse my real estate agent. Kurt knows my area. And it's a non selly way that gets in there. And I'm telling you, I see a three to five X increase in referrals when you do that. Even for new agents, like you want to get new, new you want to get your new agent, call your aunt up, ask her if you can set her up for what's going on in her market, just so she knows, because the world is crazy and you, you will get referrals from your aunt you never would have received. Uh, yeah, that's actually a great value. So that's a show, show, um, show the community value. So basically yep. find out the community value. Uh, so then that taps into what has sold. So people don't get that from uh, realtor.com or realtor.ca. They can't get that information. So that's information that you it doesn't even have to be what's sold. I just say that of um, agents seem to care so much about what's sold. And when you're doing a CMA, that of course still matters in pricing. Um, consumers I've seen emotionally care much more about what's going up on the market Oh, and okay. rather than what's sold agents agents focus on what's sold so much agents care about what their what their neighbor is trying to sell the home for when they're actually when you become an active buyer or seller then you care about what your neighbor sold for but but when you're inquisitive and i'm not looking to buy and sell right now what i care about is what are they trying to sell the house for or oh, brilliant or on open houses you call with the inquisitive factors like that says hey do you just want to know what they're remodeling or do you want to go check out your neighbor's house 
And so in that case, it has not, if that's not sold, that just, do you want to go poke around your neighbor's house? Well, I can set and sign, send you, sign you up with an alert so that you can know if on Saturday you want to go check out Susie's house. Awesome. No, and that's people, oh, I tell you, I call it real, real estate porn because we have and it, it, we have boat porn and real estate porn big time. Actually, Alberta has no water. We have mountains, and yet we had the highest disproportionate number of uh, boat owners, like yep. go figure. So yeah, know what people, and people are looking. They want to know. They want to know this is the biggest investment of their life. What's the third thing? Um, well, I mean, that's actually that third thing is, I mean, is, is actually letting people know that they can reach out to you when they're not actively buying and selling. So you need to have content for um, for your sphere, for your contacts, when they're not active buyers and sellers. And so our point about new leads, agents are so focused on new leads. That's what they put out. Most agents fail on social media because all they're talking about is new listing, yeah. new listing, open house. Here's what I sold. Well, if you're in a market that your, your, your clients move every 10 years, well, then that means, and usually you look for a home for about six months in that transaction. That means if it's 10 years on average, that means 95% of the people that I know right now are not active buyers and sellers. So if I'm yep. posting stuff on social media that doesn't reach that 95% of the people, they're just not going to interact. The same thing applies for content that I might send out in an email. And so it's actually a lot easier for agents. It's hard sometimes to come out with meaningful content for active yep. buyers and sellers. But what's going on in the community? How do you serve them? How do you let them know about what's going on as a festival? That's stuff that's actually easy to do, and it's not selling. So that's huge. The 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 simplest thing, uh, I'm going to give everybody one tip that has served me really well over the years, um, and it's super easy, is put a honey-do list of things each month on your list that on your on your website that you should be doing to preserve the value of your home. And you don't even have to write it out. You can have somebody who is a local contractor or a lawn maintenance. Ask them, say, hey, I have a community that I serve and I would love if each month I could count on by the 15th of each month, you could have what people should be doing to increase or sustain the value of their house next month. Would you be open to giving me a paragraph or three topics or something like that each month? And I, in turn, will let people know that this information came from. Oh my gosh, The you know what? Most people don't do this because they're afraid to ask. And yet I had people who were always going, I would have not remembered to clear out my gutters or to turn off this or to do that if it wasn't for your honeydew list. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you with that, a lot of people, they'll, even those that, that, that will get over their fear to ask, then they'll stop doing it when the, when the, that lawn person doesn't call, doesn't, doesn't send that to them. So what you, you want to make it easy on them as well. Ask them, say, Hey, will you send that to me? Or can I just call you like, you know, at the first of every month and ask you, hey, what should I be doing this month? And you just literally you could take three record hours it. at the beginning and just record it for them and, and call and ask. And, and, and hey, it's a five minute call. You tell me what's there and you record it. You can write it. You can give it to a VA to put down and then you're going to get it out of there. Because just like real estate agents, many of these service providers, um, coffee shop owners, they don't have a system to say, how should I actually I should remember to follow up with you. That's a great idea. I love it. And I'm not going to remember. But as long as I'm open to it, hey, you're either going to call me and ask, or if you, depending on the community, if you're serving with somebody, if you go to church or synagogue with them, you just, they know that you're going to ask them, you know, once a week and hey, just after service, can I just ask you what should people be doing? And then you just jot down your notes. So it may be, it may be something you have to do to help suck that information out of their head, but people want to do it. They just may not have a system to follow up, which benefits you that much more because you're actually helping them then by, by doing something to, to suck it out of their head. Okay, Kurt, this is why you are one of my new favorite people. I have to tell you, brilliant folks, call them, record them. Don't ask them to send it to you. Say, I'd like to call you once a month, uh, lunchtime, or swing by your, your office. How does that sound? We're going to do a quick 20-minute recording. From that, I'm going to create a short article, by the way, Jasper io fabulous fabulous uh product it is an automation product where you can actually put a lot of this stuff in and it will create a beautiful art article for you then you're going to take the video 
and you're going to chop it up and you're going to put it on TikTok and you're going to put it on your YouTube channel and you're going to tag. Oh my God, Kurt, you're brilliant. You're brilliant. All right. So we're going to wrap this up. We're going to find out what Kurt is reading. Kurt, what's the one book? First, what's the one book you're reading right now? Because I know you're reading a book. Smart people read lots of books. Um, I am reading, oh gosh, well, I just started it this morning. So it's like, it's hard for me to remember. Uh, I am reading a book called, um, a uh, book on Christian discipline. And I don't remember the name of it right now. So. Discipline. I like how you, so yeah. structure. So you're always looking to better. Is that around your time? Is yeah. that around your benefit to your family and Hannah Grace? Yeah, it's or? called the Celebrate, Celebration of Discipline. It came out in 1978, but redone in 2007. Awesome. And what is the one book you think every real estate agent should read? No matter Profit affiliation. First. Profit, Profit first. First, profit first. That was an easy one for him. All right, Kurt, how can people find you, follow you, or get in contact with you? I practice what I preach. So KurtEuler.com is my hub for everything. If you want to know more about, you know, what it's like as an operator and entrepreneur, it'll send you off to my Instagram. You want more business stuff? It'll send you to LinkedIn. Or if you want to read about servant leadership, you can find it on my website. I love that servant leadership, folks. This is really critical. The world needs you to step up into that space. The world needs good, solid leaders in every community. Every door, every home deserves a servant leader to see them and value them. All right. What is a quote that you live by? Yeah. Uh, I get credit for this, but it came from my mom, which was, we don't go to sleep when we're tired. We go to sleep when we're done. Oh, <laughs> I would never sleep, Kurt. I would never sleep. But that is, we don't go to sleep when we're tired. We go to sleep when you're done. And she probably got that because your dad only slept an hour and a half. Well, I, actually, I, I first remember that when I was like seven years old, my dad was actually sleeping. And mom and I were ranking leaves at our cottage in Michigan at, by moonlight. And I'm like the seven-year-old crying when we go to bed. And she's like, I'm like, when do we go to sleep? She's like, when we're done. That is awesome. So don't sleep on the job, job, folks. Understand your role and what you should be doing. It's so critical. We actually are recognized as a um, an essential service. World just went through one of the greatest turmoils that I will ever see probably in my lifetime. And we were an essential service. Housing and home is an essential space. So Things that we learned today real quick, and we're going to wrap this up. Get your bio done, ask the hard questions, and don't cry when people give you true feedback. Secure your URL because it is your home for the duration of your career and then beyond. And the last one is, is own your contact. Own your database. Have a separate spot that is yours aside from all the big spaces. So again, maybe just a Google Excel spreadsheet. So uh, really appreciate everybody's time. And you know, even when the days are long and hard, you got this, you got this. We get the opportunity to really serve and build communities, build communities beyond putting in the, the foundation or the, the deep services or anything. We build the communities that make community. We build the communities so that we can help make them great. And people are what make community great. So again, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us. I am Kim Hayden. This is 500 Doors Real Estate Podcast. And why 500 Doors? Because behind every door, there is an opportunity. Oh, 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 oh